Well, let's get to it. Uh, we launched a new series a couple of Sundays ago that we're calling Living by Faith. It's a 12-part series from the book of Romans, and we're looking forward to it. So that first sermon a couple of weeks ago sort of laid the groundwork, a, a, a bit of an introduction for the sermons ahead. The next 10 sermons that'll get peppered uh, throughout the Sundays ahead, that'll pretty much take us up to Easter with other things that's go- that are going on. The next 10 sermons from Romans will encourage us and instruct us along the lines of living by faith. But before we get to those next 10, before we get to those predominantly, primarily encouraging messages, there's some important business for us ahead here in the book of Romans. Before we can solve any problem, we, uh, we must first acknowledge the problem, right? First step. Before the solution comes the diagnosis. Before the cure comes knowing the sickness, identifying the sickness. And so it is with us and the lessons here in Romans. Before living by faith, we need to see that there's just no other way to live. Before receiving the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus, we need to know how desperately we need Jesus and the salvation that only he can give. Before we can find righteousness, the righteousness that God provides, we need to see that to us, without God, righteousness is lost, right? So that's what lies before us in the pages ahead that start with Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 18. It says this. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The verses that follow through Romans up to the kind of middle of chapter 3 detail the godlessness and wickedness of people, all people, us people. It's, it's sin in two dimensions. It's godlessness. It's, it's the way we treat God with disregard and wickedness, the way we treat one another. Uh, this key verse that introduces this, this large, long passage that introduces this idea of godlessness and wickedness has something in common with what we've already identified as the key verse of all of the book of Romans. We talked about it last time, and I'm going to ask you to read it with me here in a moment. Notice that in verse 18 it says that the wrath of God is being revealed. A revelation of the wrath of God is contrasted with the revelation of God's righteousness. Let's go back to that key verse. Uh, We'll put it up on the screen. Will you just read it out loud with me? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as is it, it, the righteous will live by faith. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. What is revealed? The righteousness of God is revealed. The life of faith is a life of revelation. In Romans is a book of revelation. When we get, when, when, when we get close to God, there is always Revelation. Things are revealed. When we get close to God, the righteousness of God is revealed. And our godlessness and wickedness, our unrighteousness, is revealed. The stuff that is met with the wrath of God. Revelation. I think that things being revealed, I think that revelation is what sometimes keeps us at arm's length from God. When we get close to God, his righteousness, his love, his holiness, his nature is revealed. And when we get close to God, our frailty is revealed. Both can be an overwhelming revelation. And sometimes we just rather not deal with it. 
we determine that ignorance is bliss, right? Because it takes courage and faith and confidence in God to allow ourselves to be drawn close to God, to, to deal with the revelation of his righteousness and the revelation of our unrighteousness. Friends, it can be hard being close to God. It can be hard being close to God. But where else are we going to go? <laughs> right? Where else are we going to go? Revelation. Starting with verse 18, our unrighteousness, our godlessness and wickedness is revealed. The stuff that can only be met with the wrath of our pure and holy God. So let's consider that word wrath. Wrath. Have you ever experienced wrath? Have you ever, have you ever had wrath? <laughs> Maybe in a little bit, right? <laughs> What's it like? Shout something out. What's wrath like? Say again. Bad. Bad. I think I heard anger. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Exhausting. Exhausting. What else? Anything else? Rude. Say again. Rude. Rude? Yeah, okay. I think our wrath is often hot, <laughs> right? It's filled with emotion, perhaps with revenge and anger. It's mixed with our own pain. Whatever God's wrath is, whatever God's wrath is, we know it must be something quite different than our wrath. Because our wrath is often rooted in our own frailty and sin. Our wrath is often rooted in our pain and impatience. Right? God's wrath is rooted in his nature, his holiness, his righteousness. God's wrath, this intense and purposeful response to our godlessness and wickedness, really is just a matter of how incompatible we are with God's nature, at least in our natural state, right? It's oil and water, it's fire and ice. It's the way magnets powerfully repel one another when the poles are unaligned. The wrath of God it says, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. People are without excuse. You know, we might like to wonder, ponder, theologize, philosophize about questions like, are we accountable for which we are unaware? Can people be judged for their godlessness and wickedness if they don't know any better? The scripture's clear here. We know better. We know better. We know that there is a God powerful and divine. We understand it from all creation and we understand it because we are his creation, created to know him. And while that sort of general understanding is not enough to save us, it's not enough for us to understand and receive God's mercy and grace, right? That takes an introduction to Jesus. It takes scripture. While that's not enough, it should be enough to drive us to him. Creation alone is enough for us to long for a relationship with God, to serve him and seek him. We should be able to see God, but our eyes are broken. Right? We should be able to see God, but our eyes are broken. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human and birds and animals and reptiles and such. Our eyes are broken and our thinking is broken too. We invent ways to disregard God. 
We invent ways to rationalize the wickedness we inflict on others. We put our thoughts ahead of God's thoughts, our philosophies ahead of God's truth. And these days, we may not craft images that look like us or animals and call them gods, but how is our worship of celebrity, our worship of wealth, our worship of style any different than that? Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and, and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Well, that isn't particularly uh, politically correct at all, is it? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> right? I mean, when folk want to confront homosexual, so homosexuality with the Bible, this is often among the places we go. And here we are. In this passage, first of all, allow me to point out that verses 24 and 25, the first half of what I have up on the screen, these actually have more to do with the verses before them than after them. So here's what I mean. In the context of Romans, in that Roman society influenced by Greek philosophy and religion and pagan religion, in that, in that context, the degrading of their bodies with one another was a reference to depraved worship. Uh, like I said, influence in those pagan and Greek religious practices, it was common for worship to be so degraded, misguided worship to be so degraded that it would include ritualistic sex. Now, I could go into a great deal of detail about why that is, was the case, but I'll just leave that to your own study. <laughs> Ask me later if you want. The point is that religion left in the hands of the godless and wicked, devolves into the gross and dehumanizing. That's the point here. This sort of godless religion strips us of dignity. It twists that which should be beautiful into something wicked and dehumanizing. Our worship is broken. That wasn't just a problem then. Worship is broken now. Right? Misguided worshipers dehumanize and enslave. Deceived worshipers perform the full range of godless and wicked acts in the name of their philosophies and so-called gods. For some, it's really blatant. Forms of jihad and such. For others, it's more insidious, like greed and materialism. Our worship is broken, and our nature is broken. We violate the natural order established by God, exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones. I mean, there's a hard language here, right? Notice in both cases it says that God gave them over. I think we would err if we understood that to mean that God abandons or God causes this sort of evil. This is not a matter of God imposing punishment so much. This is rather just an acknowledgement of the truth of what godlessness and wickedness means and does. Without a pull toward God, without a driving to the righteousness of God, these are the results. This is what sin does. This is the depravity that is in each of us and the results that await us when we travel the path of wrath rather than the path of righteousness. And it's not merely brokenness that we demonstrate with our bodies. It's brokenness of mind and heart too. Allow me to read on. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. 
They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Entertained by it, laughing at it, approving of those that do them. You know, maybe we should play a game, a little exercise. We could start by having everyone stand, and then, uh, then I could read the list again. And when you hear your sin, you can go ahead and sit down. Would you like to, would you, would, would you like to play that game with me today? <laughs> would we expect anyone to remain standing? I mean, knowing the rules of the game, I don't think I'd even bother to stand in the first place. Who wants to play that game? Apart from God's mercy, grace, and restoring power, no one, not any of us, can stand. We're broken. Humanity is broken. No one has an excuse, and no one has any righteous standing. This is the verdict for each and every human. We are broken. We have what might seem like an insurmountable problem rooted in the godlessness and wickedness common to all humanity. Jesus put it like this. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Right? We commonly believe that religion is about polishing up the outside of our lives, putting on our Sunday best and getting it together for these moments when people might take notice. But Jesus says no, and our text in Romans says no. (laughs) It's what's inside that counts, and that's a scary thought. With the beginning of chapter two, Paul turns from all of humanity to one specific slice of humanity. He starts by saying, you, therefore, have no excuse. And we ought to ask, who is you? (laughs) Well, when we read on, we understand that you are the religious people. It was the Jewish Christians in that specific context, those who came from the historic people of God, those who were the keepers of God's word, those entrusted with God's promises, these are the ones who Paul commends later on in the passage as having great value when he said that there was much advantage to being a Jew. He said, listen, first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. There was great advantage to being a religious person like this. Nevertheless, the religious people were in great danger The religious people were in great danger. It was as if Paul imagined those first hearers of the word that he wrote, that he had in mind who would be hearing and reading these words. He could see those religious ones. Hearing Paul explain just how depraved and wicked wicked and godless humanity can be. And he could see those religious people with arms folded, and that smug, knowing look on their faces. He can imagine how the religious people, we religious people, might think that Paul was talking about somebody else, might think that Paul was talking about those people. We all know who those people are, right? (laughs) Just not us. But Paul knew something critically important, and it's this. There is nothing that keeps us from true righteousness as powerfully as self-righteousness. 
There is nothing that keeps us from true righteousness as powerfully as self-righteousness keeps us from true righteousness. It seems that some of the biggest barriers in the way of our pursuit of righteousness are the ones we build ourselves. We so eagerly trade true righteousness for self-righteousness. So Paul says, let's not waste any time judging others. You, therefore, have no excuse, he says. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgments against those who do such things is, is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness? Do you show contempt for his forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Our text goes on to explain that it's not a matter of having God's written law or not having it. It's not a matter of doing various religious things or not doing various religious things, but rather it's a matter of what's in our hearts. And what's in our hearts is not good enough to stand before our holy and righteous God. What's in our hearts, godlessness, wickedness, judgment, what's in our hearts condemns us. And he's not done with us. Chapter three, it's summarized for us in chapter three. And like any good preacher, Paul bases his message in scripture. What we read in, in chapter three as a summary of all of this is all qu quoting scripture. There is no unrighteousness, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. That's Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. That's Psalm 5. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. That's Psalm 140 and Psalm 10. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. That's Isaiah 59. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's Psalm 36. The word of God is true and powerful. This is the verdict on all humanity, not merely from Paul's imagination to the Romans, but from God's word throughout the ages. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Are we conscious? <laughs> Are we convinced? Are we conscious of our sin? Whether through God's word before us today, whether through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, or simply through what we know about ourselves, are we conscious of our sin? This is the point of our text today, to remind us of our sin, this hopelessness of our predicament, this godlessness and wickedness of humanity. Jesus puts it like this. Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Slaves to sin. Does that sound like good news? Slaves to, being enslaved by anything or anyone sounds terrible. Slaves to sin. How can being a slave to sin be anything like good news? Would you believe me if I told you that Jesus meant it as good news? That being a slave to sin has a kernel, has an important truth embedded in it that is good news. And it's right there if we read on. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free Indeed. We're slaves to sin, but we're not children of sin. <laughs> we can be 
freed. We can't be purchased out of family relationships, but we can be purchased out of slavery. And that's good news. See, the gospel contains the news that everyone who sins, and we all sin, is a slave to sin. That's good news because slaves can be freed. (laughs) Slaves can be freed. Slaves to sin are freed by Jesus to become children of God. Think of it. You know, we might get to the end of our text in Romans and think that we are doomed to be slaves to sin. Doomed. That we are inevitably the targets of God's wrath because of our godlessness and wickedness. And we would be absolutely right to conclude that we are slaves to sin, but we are not doomed. We are not doomed. I'm going to cheat and read on. This is the text for next week's sermon. But it's important that we get there. We've got to get past Romans 3.20. Romans 3.21 says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. The righteousness of God has been revealed, or reminded, right? To which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew, Gentile, religious, not religious. There's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his, of his blood to be received by faith. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Don't just clap a little bit, clap a lot of it. That's the truth. The point of confronting our godlessness and wickedness, the point of confronting God's wrath is to drive us to faith. Let faith arise. We are not merely left with a doomed awareness of our godlessness and wickedness, but we have this promise. We have this promise, this promise that has only made more rich and more beautiful the more we understand how attainable it is on our own. We are hopeless without a Savior. But we have this great promise. We have this great hope. We have this great Savior. So we run to Jesus. We run to Jesus, our refuge. We receive by faith the life that Jesus purchased for us. Think of it. And on this day, this first Sunday of the month, when we do a couple of things, we put on name tags to remind everybody what our names are on the first Sunday of the month, and we prepare these symbols. We come to the Lord's table. On this day, on this day we receive these powerful symbols. Our righteousness was not free. Even though we did not pay for it, even though we could not pay for it, this righteousness is not free. Our righteousness was purchased by Jesus through his sacrifice, by God's mercy and grace, through his love, his pain, his sinless life, his humiliation, and his blood. That's what's before us today in these symbols, in these powerful symbols. It's represented in this bread and this cup The Apostle Paul explained it like this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he he took the cup and saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, whenever you remember the Lord's pain and humiliation and sacrifice, his love and mercy demonstrated through his body, 
fully God and fully man, taking on the punishment. When you take this bread and you take this cup, remembering his blood spilled for us, purchasing holiness with his very blood, when you take this bread and you take this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember and we believe. Friends, eating this little morsel of bread and drinking this little bit of, uh, of juice doesn't save anyone. But it's what we're reminded of. It's what we believe when we do so that saves us. It's by faith for all who believe. We come with this full realization, this fresh reminder of our failure, of our godlessness, our disregard for God, our wickedness, our disregard for one another. We come with this fresh and new revelation of the wrath of God, and we receive and we give thanks. We believe. That's what saves us. That's the only part of the deal that we can possibly have. We believe. So come. <laughs> Run to Jesus today and believe. So we're going to receive communion here. Uh, if, if, you've not, uh, if you've not been, uh, been uh, part of, the, of uh, communion with us here at North Shore, just let me tell you how, how it goes. Um, we're going to pray in a moment. And you're welcome to come. You don't need to be a member of this church or a member of any church to, uh, to participate in communion. Just make it an act of belief. And when we believe together, whether it's for the first time or for the umpteenth time, we're welcomed again. We're part of the family of God, the people of God. We're no longer slaves to sin, we're reminded in this holy moment. We're children of God, purchased by the very Son of God, freed from the slavery of sin, to live the life that, uh, that, he, uh, that he purchased for us. We believe. So we invite you to come forward and, uh, and take the cup and take the bread and give thanks and believe. We invite you to come together with, uh, with friends or family if you'd like. Uh, if, it's just, uh, if it's just hard for you to make it to the front, uh, Chris will be, uh, will be around and uh, we'll keep an eye out for those that uh, just might... This might be difficult to come forward. He'll be glad to bring uh, the bread and the cup to you. Pastor Wayne's going to come. Pastor Steve's going to come. We'll be here at the front. Uh, the team is going to lead us in a song. Let's believe and receive. Let's stand together. Can I lead you in prayer as we stand together? Father, for this holy moment, we give thanks. Our Father, we give you thanks for the power of your word and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that reminds us of how hopeless and helpless we are without you. That reminds us of godless and wickedness that is the plight of all humanity. Without you, we have nothing to offer, nothing to give. But we have you. And it's represented so beautifully here before us in the bread and the cup. This bread representing your broken body, this cup representing your spilled blood. We receive it with thanksgiving knowing that it wasn't free, but it's for us. So we take it and we believe. Lord, as we receive this bread, help us to, to thank you again for your sacrifice. As we receive this cup, help us to thank you again that you've washed us, that you've cleansed us by your sacrifice so that we are free from the wrath of God and we receive and are receiving the righteousness of God. Lord, we commit these moments to you. We commit our lives to your service. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, you can come when you're ready. Let's run to Jesus and receive. God bless you, friends.